What do you think? As of 2007, which August was the hottest on record in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Utah, and West Virginia? The correct answer is 2007. August 2007 temperatures were also much above normal in an additional 15 states stretching from California to Delaware. On August 16, 2007, a reactor at Brown's Ferry Nuclear Plant in northern Alabama was shut down for a very unusual reason. The water in the Tennessee River was so hot, exceeding an average of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 32 Celsius, over 24 hours, that it could no longer cool the reactor. The closure proved to be one of the most striking symptoms of a deadly heat wave that would kill more than 50 people in eight southeastern states. The heat wave had few North American equals. It proved to be the warmest August in 113 years for West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and Utah. Alabama suffered at least 10 consecutive days of triple digit temperatures prior to the Browns Ferry closure. At the 30th annual remembrance of Elvis Presley's death in Memphis, a 67 year old fan died in a tent in an RV park behind the Heartbreak Hotel, just down the street from Graceland. A thermometer registered 111, or 44 Celsius, inside the tent. The mercury hit 106. Or 41 Celsius that day, breaking the record set in 1943 by 3 degrees. The heat wave was created by a strong, high pressure ridge over the eastern U.S., which kept the jet stream well to the north while deflecting cooler air masses. Large scale subsidence beneath the ridge also enhanced surface warming. Unlike previous heat waves, nighttime did not bring cool relief. A 32 year old Memphis man had a body temperature of 109.4, or 43 Celsius, when he was found dead at dawn during the height of the heat. By August 29th, 13 new all time record high maximum temperature records were established, as were 28 new all time record high lows. A heat wave's deadliness depends at least as much on overnight lows as it does on daytime highs. When temperatures fail to cool off at night, There is no escape for people in homes without air conditioning. With each passing day of a heat wave, the home accumulates more heat. Such prolonged exposure to high heat greatly increases the risk of dehydration, heat stroke, and heart and breathing problems. The 2007 heat wave echoed another, far deadlier event the 2003 European heat wave, when temperatures soared in some areas by as much as 5.4 standard deviations above normal. 22 to 35,000 people died, and the continent saw 12.3 billion in losses to crops and livestock, 1.2 million acres burned, reduced hydropower, and, just as at Brown's Ferry, nuclear plant shutdowns. True or false? Burns from fire are a common form of injury during heavy snowfall and freezing rain events. Counterintuitive as it may seem, this fact is true. You'll learn why in the following lesson. Mainers knew that a winter storm was coming in early January 1998. What they didn't know was that the three day barrage would glaze every exposed surface in ice up to four inches thick, enough to more than double their 30 year old record, and enough to inspire one meteorologist of 31 years' experience to describe the result as apocalyptic. And the ice was only the beginning of the region's problems. Ice from the storm's first volley on January 7th turned sidewalks and driveways into slip and slides. Local emergency room doctors began treating scores of broken wrists and hips. But the storm's full power was not felt until trees, utility poles, and electric lines started to fall. The air was filled with the sound of rifle fire as the ice snapped millions of trees like toothpicks. One man died when struck by a falling tree while helping a neighbor clear debris from his yard. The fallen trees also blocked repair and relief efforts. Parts of 50 state roads were closed. The storm touched more people than any other 20th century main disaster for one big reason. 
it created the biggest and longest-lasting power outage in the state's history. Eighty percent of Maine's population lost electricity, in some places for two weeks. As lights blinked out and heating systems died, temperatures dropped below freezing, leaving hundreds of thousands shivering in hard-to-reach rural areas. To the dangers of fallen power lines and ice-slicked pavement were added those of fire, hypothermia, and carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide can often build up inside homes where generators are used without proper ventilation, sickening or killing the occupants. Two main men died from generator-related carbon monoxide poisoning. Hundreds of others sickened by the gas with headaches, nausea, and flu-like symptoms also landed in emergency rooms. The lack of electricity caused other health problems. A fourth Maine man died when he fell downstairs in the dark. Three local emergency rooms saw a 47% increase in their admissions after the storm, especially from cold exposure, lung disease, heart problems, and burns. Accidental fires were started by people unaccustomed to using candles and wood stoves. These problems were compounded when residents were unable to call for help. People frustrated by days or weeks without power sometimes lost their mental composure. One unhinged man threatened to hold several central main power employees hostage until they turned on his power. Police fielded calls from several domestic assaults and fistfights they blamed on storm-related stress. When it was over, 44 people had died in ice-related fatalities, including five in Maine and 28 in Canada. Hypothermia and carbon monoxide poisoning from generator-fueled efforts to avoid hypothermia were largely to blame. Thousands suffered injuries, illnesses, and stress-related mental health problems. Forecasters pinned part of the blame for the ice on El Nino, which affected wind currents, pushing warm, moist air farther north than usual. Normally, Maine is too cold in January for freezing rain, and snow falls instead. Guess how many people contracted West Nile virus in North America in the year 1998? The correct answer is zero. West Nile virus was not reported in North America until 1999. In July 1999, animal pathologist Tracy McNamara was surprised and dismayed to find dozens of crows and a few exotic birds had dropped dead in and around the Bronx Zoo in New York City. Tissue tests showed both crows and rare birds had lesions in their hearts and brains that matched no known diagnosis. At the same time, senior citizens began turning up at the Flushing Hospital in Queens, feverish, weak, and confused. The seniors didn't seem to have much in common except that they liked to spend time outdoors in the evening, a time of day mosquitoes prefer. Investigators initially thought the culprit was St. Louis encephalitis, a mosquito-borne illness present in the United States since the 1930s. But St. Louis encephalitis doesn't kill birds. West Nile virus does. Testing revealed that it was this virus that was felling both birds and people. Although the virus had never before been seen outside of Africa, Europe, and Asia, it had somehow crossed the Atlantic. Before that summer's epidemic was over, 62 people had suffered nervous system disease and seven had died. Many of the survivors suffered persistent neurological impairment. What was little discussed that summer was the role the weather may have played in the virus's success. In the months leading up to the outbreak, severe spring and summer drought and a three-week northeastern heat wave favored the virus. The mosquito that carries West Nile in the east, Culex pipiens, thrives in city stormwater catch basins, where pools of nutrient-rich water linger unflushed during drought. Warm temperatures also hasten reproduction of viruses within mosquitoes, increasing the chance a mosquito will transmit the virus before the insect reaches the end of its lifespan. In more natural environments like wetlands, drought can kill mosquito predators like frogs and dragonflies, and it may encourage birds to congregate around shrinking water sources, becoming easy targets for mosquitoes. In areas outside cities, on the other hand, Heavy rains can aggravate the problem by creating more of the temporary, stagnant pools where wildland mosquitoes breed. 
The World Health Organization estimated that warming and precipitation changes due to climate change claimed how many lives between 1975 and 2005. Although 150,000 lives, 5,000 per year, is a significant number, this estimate is conservative and does not include the lives that were lost to storms, floods, and drought-induced food shortages. But the worst is yet to come. The scale of climate change impacts on human health is likely to expand greatly in the 21st century. Climate change health impacts are not always obvious, though climate change is likely to affect human health in profound and serious ways. One way it may initially affect your viewers has nothing to do with rising seas or raging hurricanes. It involves ragweed. Biologist Louis Ziska studied the ragweed of Baltimore in 2001, where, like many cities, Carbon dioxide concentrations can be 30 percent higher than in rural areas, thanks to car exhaust and the urban heat island effect. He found ragweed plants in vacant city lots grew three to five times bigger than their country cousins, released pollen weeks earlier, and produced ten times more of it. In a few decades, similar carbon dioxide concentrations will likely blanket the world. More carbon dioxide and decaying plant matter will also encourage allergy-provoking mold. In short, in the not too distant future, it's likely there will be a whole lot more sniffling, coughing, and wheezing. Global climate change could threaten our health in many other ways: hotter, deadlier heat waves, more infectious disease, stronger and more frequent extreme weather events, reduced air and water quality, and hazards created by warmer, wetter winters. As these examples make clear, your viewers' health and well-being is intimately tied to the weather they experience. There are health and safety implications for almost any kind of weather you may forecast. Warm, sunny days pose threats in the form of damaging UV radiation, poor air quality, and high heat indices. Drought can degrade both water quality when reservoirs shrink and wells go dry, and air quality when wildfires produce vast clouds of health-harming smoke. Winter weather can cause traffic accidents, power outages, frostbite, and hypothermia. Convective storms unleash lightning, high winds, hail, tornadoes, and flash floods. Tropical cyclones can devastate entire communities with their storm tides, ferocious winds, and torrential rains. Your viewers will need someone they trust to turn to when health-threatening weather events happen. You need to know the health implications of all the weather you regularly forecast. Also, you should be aware of who in your viewing audience is especially at risk, and what precautions people should take to safeguard their homes and families. In the following units, you'll learn how you can help them.